Th thanks everyone and uh, welcome to the team integration or the team uh, integrability track of uh, the annual conference. Uh, so um, I'm not going to be speaking too much today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, co-presenters from WHO and from uh, the MOH in Uganda. Um, let's see, yeah. um, so this is basically the, 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 the split of today. Um, th there is an expert launch uh, from four four o'clock and, and going going on until maybe five. Uh, probably we will spend some of the time uh, also for the panel, depending on on on, on the needs and how much time time we, we require. Uh, other than that, it's a little bit of background on DHS two and, and the integration team. Uh, as I said, this uh, so Sarah will talk about the goal data integration that they've been doing with uh, DHS two and the UPC, and then Dan will talk about how they had integrated uh, the ICD eleven service into DHS2. So uh, the team isn't big. Uh, it's currently just consists of uh, Bob Jolliffe and, and me, uh, and none of us is working 100% on it. So we are both part-time involved in this, although we are hoping to grow and, and hire more, more, more people. Um, we have weekly calls every week. Um, you can join those calls if you really have something you want to discuss with us in, in, in person. Um, or we also have this monthly open HIE calls that you're also free to join. Uh, a bit more about that on the next slides. Um, and if you have any kind of questions regarding um, DHS2 and, and integrability in, in general, feel free to, to sh shoot up a question to integration at dhs2.org and, and we will we'll get, get back to you um, quickly. So yeah, so part of what we have been doing and in the last few months is, is, is gradually getting involved in open HIE community again, because we haven't really been much involved in the last few years, although we have joined some calls from time to time. Um, so we have started, restarted, one, one might say, the, um, the involvement in, in the open HIE uh, HMIS group, the Health Management Information System group. Uh, that means we have a, a monthly call now um, talking about uh, HMIS in general, uh, although it, it's very, very much DHS2 centric for now, although it, it doesn't have to be necessarily, but for now it, it def definitely is. Um, topics that would be st stuff like ADX and, and aggregate data exchange. Um, we, also, we also seem to kind of from time to time also lean into uh, organ data exchange and option set exchange and all this kind of other stuff that's kind of related to it. Um, and the other one we have been started also re regularly joining is the facility registry calls, uh, or MFL if you want, and, and this kind of um, basically, basically organic stuff, right? And we are also getting involved in, in some emerging standards like MCSD, SVCM, and ADX, and a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, right. So, uh, so. It, 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 it has been a kind of hard for us to kind of know, seeing that we are a very, very small team, we have kind of tried to figure out exactly where our focus should be. Um, so for now, we have kind of narrowed it down to, um, so within the open HIE, we have narrowed it down to using so what are called the MCSD and SVCM. So MCSD is basically taking a couple of resources from FHIR. So FHIR is, is a standard for doing um, health in, in interability, right? So, um, but, but it's a big, very, very big standard and, and it's, and it's um, not kind of something you can just take out of the box. You kind of need to profile it. They will kind of take the bits and pieces that you want uh, from it. And, and, and one of those profiles is called MCSD, uh, which is basically taking a couple of resources called um, the location and or, or, or organization and a few others and, and kind of um, uh, allowing us to exchange um, organization units um, from DHS2 uh, to into, say, for example, a Happy Fire server, or also taking uh, Happy uh, Fire resources from a Happy Fire service and putting it into DHS2 using a common format. Um, and then SVCM is, is the same when it comes to uh, option sets or any kind of grouped items or code lists. Uh, it doesn't have to be, be, be option sets necessarily. It can also be uh, categories, category options, uh, even organization groups and group sets, that could also be a, a, a code list. So any kind of code list really that we want to get out of the HS2 and kind of exchange with a different system. Um, and we have started um, a bit of work on, 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 on a Python based tool to kind of help us with doing all this, this, this exchange. So um, that is not done yet. 
uh, we have done some progress on that and hopefully in a, few, in a couple of weeks we will have something that's actually working um, so, so the, the starting the first release will support pulling out MCSD and also FCSM from DCS2 and then um, putting it into an, for example a happy fire server or, or some, some kind of fire service um, hopefully we will also support taking data out of a fire service and then putting it back into DHS2 and, and then we can have, kind of have this kind of full circle uh, integration with that. So the, as I said, that is not done yet. Uh, it, it, will, it will be announced on the, on the COP when, when it's actually uh, ready. Uh, and then hopefully people, people can try it out. Um, the reason for using Python for this, I just want to mention that it's, it's basically because um, it, it is very much it's just a default when it comes to the kind of ETL exchange and, and it's also um, installed by default on uh, Ubuntu and, and all kind of uh, services or, or Linux distributions. So even Fedora and everything will have that installed by default. So you don't actually have to install a bunch of other packages to, to, to make that work. Um, in the long term, we kind of want to expand on that uh, and we want to create something that's called fire profiles or implementation guides. Um, so what that basically means is that so FHIR is a very generic standard in many ways in the, in the same way as DCS2 is. So uh, while there is a patient resource in, in FHIR, it, by, by default, nothing is required. So you, all you have to say is it's a resource type is patient and that's it. That's already uh, a, a FHIR compliant patient. So not, not, normally what you want to do then is kind of profile that. And, and so you would uh, say, okay, we also require the name, we have the date of birth, maybe the location, maybe the, the, the organization is linked to and so on. Um, so those things are something that has to be done to kind of profile fire. Now this is a quite of a tedious work and probably you already have something in DHS2 that's called a patient. So you probably have a track entity already called patient that you already added, say you have some, um, um, some track entity attributes, for example, you have the male, female, maybe you have the date of birth, uh, the name, of course, and so on and so on and so on. And then, then you need to some way of mapping that out of DHS2 and into FHIR, basically. Um, now, this is not something that can be done 100% fully automatic, for sure. Uh, but we are hoping to kind of uh, expand on this tool so you can kind of point uh, that tool into your DHS2 metadata. Say, for this program, I, I want to actually, as, as, as much as possible, um, generate a fire profile of it. Now, again, this is just a starting point, uh, and we are also hoping to kind of start with um, start start with the, the WHO metadata packages. So, hopefully, in the future, all of the WHO packages will include some kind of fire profile uh, linked linked to them. Um, so yeah, so basically, this tool will output FSH, which is the fire shorthand, and then we will kind of compile it down to the fire profiles. Uh, just a little bit about the ADX stuff uh, Bob has been doing. So um, I think we have to hurry, hurry up a little bit. But uh, so basically, um, Bob has been working on, on, on codifying some of these um, aggregate um, packages that we have for the COVID. Um, there are some issues there, and they're kind of trying to now standardize uh, the codes. So I don't think they're using any kind of global standard right now, but they're kind of making their own standardized codes for now. Uh, and so I'm sure Bob can talk more about that and, uh, <clears throat> and in, in the panel discussions if anyone wants to have a bit more details around it. Um, so that's something that's being worked on. It's been worked on for a few, few months. I think that's nearing completion at least. But so, so yeah, that, that's something that's also coming soon uh, as, as part of the, the, the metadata packages that we have shared. So yeah. Um, I think that's, that's uh, it's not time for panel, sorry. <laughs> the final panel comes after. I think uh, given that it's already 10 past, um, I think it's time to move over to, to Sarah. Uh, I just want to say that, um, so we will now have 15 minutes we started talking about the Go data integration. It will be, um, then we will have the, um, the Daniel, we talk about ICD-11 integration and then there will be a panel and a question and answer session. So feel free to already now start thinking about topics for that session. If you have anything you want to talk about, um, there might be standards within the duration. There might be just a general DHS2 problem or, or, or so some other insights you have. Um, so please 
think about that while we're waiting for Sarah, Sarah and uh, Daniel to, to go through the presentations. Okay, thank you. Sarah, you can. Uh, Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. I will just share my screen. Okay, hope you guys can see my screen just fine. All right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's really great to be here again at the DHS2 annual conference and uh, see some familiar faces, or rather hear familiar voices. Uh, this continues to be a really important forum for us uh, for shared learnings across organizations and contexts. So thanks a lot for having us. Today, I will briefly be sharing some of our experiences in building an interoperability solution between the GoData tool and DHIS2. My name is Sarah Hollis, and I'm an epidemiologist within the Health Emergencies Program at WHO. And today, I'm joined by Peter Jovanovic and Pablo Rodriguez, who are at the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, and they've been uh, very instrumental in collaborating with us on this work during the COVID-19 response. So today we don't have much time, so I'll do a really quick overview of GoData to get everyone oriented and how the need for this project really came about. And then for the majority of the presentation, I'll pass it off to Peter and Pablo, who are the real technical wizards of this, and they will go through a more detailed technical uh, description and demo the solution if we have time, hopefully, and mainly to get feedback from the group. And I'm glad we have the expert lounge after this so we can really hear your thoughts, as this is definitely a work in progress. And in addition, hopefully hearing from countries on who would like to pilot this in your own setting as we're kind of at the point now where we're looking to pilot this in, in a country. Hey, right, Sarah, if I can interrupt for a second. You yep. just update your display setting as to the mirror selection. Right now you can see both your current and next slide on our screen. Uh, it's at the top under display settings, the top of your screen. Display settings, swap. Uh, duplicate, I think. Got it, okay, is that good now? Yes, that's perfect. Good. Okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, for those of you who are not yet familiar, GoData is an outbreak investigation tool designed and deployed among GORN partners, Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, um, and coordinated by WHO. And it's made free for use by, by member states, by countries and, and institutions. Um, and the tool in its final form today builds on previous WHO and GORN partner experience in field data collection, particularly during outbreaks. It's worth noting, and this relates to the theme of our discussion today, um, that this tool is, is not trying to be all things to all people, and instead we've tried to keep a pretty well-defined scope, focusing um, primarily on cases and contact-related data in an outbreak setting to inform contact tracing operations, and particularly in um, building and viewing chains of transmission. So here, I'll just quickly give you a snapshot of what I mean. Uh, the platform enables the ability to view relationships between entities, whether they be cases, events, clusters, contacts, in various ways to get uh, to really spot patterns in, in space and time. We're also consolidating data across case investigation forms, contact listings, follow-ups, and other related longitudinal data, such as labs and hospitalizations, to try to track the journey of a contact or case over, over their follow-up or incubation period to allow the surveillance staff to really understand where they need to intervene on a practical level. Um, so in terms of just a, a few high level key features that might be important to note for framing before we get into the interop interoperability solution. Um, so this tool is meant to be configurable across settings and outbreaks. Um, it can function offline online. We have an optional web app that functions, or sorry, mobile app that functions on Android and iOS and granular user roles and permissions so that different users within the contact tracing workforce or public health surveillance system can perform different actions or access different types of data. So for instance, a field epi would be entering in case investigation details on the web app, while a contact tracer would perhaps be performing daily follow-ups on their mobile phone, and then these would be interacting to, to produce the chains of transmission. Um, another thing important to note uh, is, and this relates to, to what you just introduced, was um, sort of the, the standards that we've tried to integrate with this platform. So we have defined templates for, for different diseases, COVID-19 being one of them, that aligns with WHO guidance, 
Um, and also we've created uh, ones for particular protocols such as the FFX protocol um, or the unity studies so that countries can quickly deploy these protocols or just the core WHO variables um, quickly and easily um, to get going. So in terms of data exchange with other platforms, so, so it's not a surprise to us that there are other systems and countries being used for, for surveillance already, um, and especially during for, for COVID-19. So we, we really built this tool to inherently be flexible to, to be able to um, interact with these other systems for either one way or two way data, ex data exchange. And there's a few ways that you could do this. We do have extensive data import and export features that are primarily file based. Um, you could also connect through MongoDB connector, um, but most of what we'll talk about and what we've explored so far uh, would be through our, our API. This is a bit of a busy slide, but I'll, I'll just set the stage before passing it off to, to Petter. Um, but we, we've had multiple requests from countries since the COVID-19 outbreak started um, that they, they wanted to be able to utilize GoData perhaps for contact tracing, but they were already using DHIS2 for their, their event-based surveillance and they wanted a way to exchange data between the two. Uh, we also want to find a way to be able to push summaries of what's being captured in GoData to the existing national health information system, oftentimes CHIS2 in countries where we're working. Um, so at this point, I'll pass it off to Petra to, to kind of um, take it away with the more technical details. Okay, thank you, Sara. And hello, everyone. My name is Petr Ivanovic. I'm from Technical University of, of Catalonia. And we are working with, with WHO for many years now, but on generally on project of neglect like, disease, but this project is specific to, to, COVID, to COVID response. Let me, uh, do you see my screen? Yep, we see it. Okay. So as Sarah said, uh, so when the, the when the COVID crisis started, uh, also multiple countries started re uh, requesting this interoperability uh, solution between GoData, the tool that they, they are supposed to use for uh, con contact tracing, and their national health information system. And on the other side, at UPC, we also uh, started a COVID-19 project that is funded by by our, uh, I mean, U UPC fund, uh, humanitarian uh, humanitarian fund. And uh, at that point, we formed like a collaborative uh, project between GoData team at WHO and also uh, UPC. And the main goal of, of the project is this to enable an, uh, an one inter interoperability uh, layer between GoData and national health information system at the country. Uh, as an example, we took DHS2 as, as, as it is the most present in the, for example, in the, in the underdeveloped and uh, developing countries. And uh, so that the countries eventually can strengthen their, their systems, uh, especially in the times of, uh, of disease outbreaks and to uh, conduct tra uh, contact tracing and analyze transmission chains why at the same time being able to have the overview of, of the COVID-19 situation in their national health information systems like DHS2. So since, uh, since the, it's an emergency project, uh, we, we were applying uh, very, very strong agile project development. So we, we had, and this was the overall goal that I mentioned before, but uh, we had to go step by step and then uh, we started, uh, started by allowing first GoData and DHS2 uh, to exchange, for example, location metadata in terms of organization units, and also the main essential information on the cases uh, between these two instances. And then with, with having this, uh, let's say, uh, first step uh, implemented, we, we started expanding incrementally to allow other kind of information to exchange between the, the systems like contacts, contacts follow-ups, uh, lab results, and also the relationships inside uh, the relationships inside the systems. And uh, as I said, so this, this is an agile project. So we started uh, started developing piece by piece, and uh, with with this, we uh, the first result that we obtained was uh, highly uh, configurable and also for now standalone in an interoperability layer, which is basically set uh, of, uh, of scripts based on React uh, framework. 
and uh, this this uh, interoperability, um, interoperability layer is uh, is able to perform different data exchange tasks that I previously uh, mentioned. So the the main point is that uh, first for the default configuration uh, we we use the DHS2 COVID-19 packages, but since of course uh, many countries could adopt this uh, could take uh, these DHS2 original DHS2 uh, COVID-19 packages and adapt to their needs or customize to to their needs or the needs of, uh, at their countries. We also enable configuration of the scripts so that they can adapt in terms of in terms of new variables and in terms of differences between the the variables. Um, but of course, this kind of uh, setting for now requires more technical oriented personnel that will administrate the, this configuration and also to uh, run the scripts. Uh, so that's why the, high, uh, the final objective of the project actually is to, to produce a DHS2 application. So in, incorporating these functionalities inside the DHS2 application that will connect, so connect to the GoData API and push data from DHS2 to GoData so in, in order to, so the countries that, for example, started collecting data in, in the AGS2, they can push to go data and continue contact tracing and then uh, um, uh, visualize, uh, visualize uh, con uh, contact, uh, contact tracing. Or also to uh, get pull data from uh, go data to the AGS2. Uh, and in, in that sense, uh, for example, they, they, they would prefer to collect some data from uh, go data to uh, inside the DGS2, either individual or aggregated data. So the, at their national health information systems, they have overview of the situation uh, at the country. So this for sure will be a much user friendlier approach. So with a with interface that most of the countries, especially uh, in Africa are, are used to like DGS2, uh, familiar with DGS2 environment. So it will be easier uh, learning curve for them to, to start using these kind of functionalities, interoperability functionalities. And uh, uh, before before I give, uh, pass uh, the slides to to Pablo to show you a demo of, of the, our interoperability layer, I would just like to go through some key takeaways. So first, uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, so Go, go Data is uh, is uh, meant to be an outbreak in investigation tool. So it, it has a very specific purpose, unlike I mean other general health information systems. And the, the point of this project uh, is to enable interoperability between Go Go Data and other surveillance systems at the countries. And especially we started by uh, DGS2, as I said, as a most used uh, system. Uh, the project is, uh, the project development is agile and um, mostly due to the emergency requests by, by the countries and by, uh, by WHO. So we are, that, that's why I mentioned, we are uh, enabling uh, part by part of uh, interoperability with a final goal of uh, building a DGS2 app with complete interoperability functionalities between Go, uh, with GoData. And uh, as a final uh, mention, I would like to invite all the countries that are, uh, that are in the presentation to contact us if they have similar uh, kind of uh, requests or similar kind of problems uh, and we can discuss and see how to exchange COVID-19 uh, COVID metadata that they are using and to see how to adapt configuration of our interoperability layer to their needs and start uh, provide them with, uh, with this interoperability layer for them. So you have a contact uh, contact email here, but uh, after the demo, I will also mention other contact information from all of us. So thank you very much. I will pass now to, to Pablo Rodriguez. He's, uh, he's also from Technical University of Catalonia. He was working on the development of, of this uh, interoperability layer. So Pablo. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK, so I'm going to share my screen now. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Nice. So hi, everyone. I'm Pablo Rodriguez, as Peter said, a developer now in the university in the Politecnical University of Catalonia and I've been working on on this solution where we are building to provide interoperability now mainly 
uh, from DHS to, to raw data. So as Peter said, we are now in, in a stage of the, of the project where, where we are focusing mainly on technical aspects, not that much on providing a usability, a, a more usable um, app that, that the countries can, can work with, like the ones that you can provide in DHIC. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, give you a small demo of what the scripts that we have developed do right now. So I'm working with the demo version of DHIC for COVID-19. And, and for GoData, I'm using a version 30, 33 installed in my own computer. So um, what we have right now is a series of different steps we can follow to, to send to GoData organization units, which are called locations uh, in GoData, cases, contacts, and the creation of outbreaks, which is, uh, well, let's say a, a structure Go Data uses that is not like that on, on the HIC. So what I'm going to do is execute these different steps for you. So we start by um, by copying the organization units into an external file that you can see here, like output.json. This is because right now we have a a uh, problem with the identifiers of the organization units that we need to keep in both DHIC and Go Data. So the only way we can do that right now is by copying them into an external file and importing them in the application. This is only for the organization units, but it's, it's nice to know. So with this, now we can go to the Go data application, which, uh, as I said, I'm running this in my computer, as you can see here. This is a, a, a clean installation of the of the Go data project. So there's nothing, as you can see, no no locations, no outbreaks, no nothing. So the first thing we're going to do is import our hierarchical structure of organization units that we created right now from the scripts. Pablo? Yeah? Uh, you have two minutes left, just, just, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is going to be really, really quick. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <I just don't laughs> Thanks. So here we have our organization copy. Again, I'm using the demo version of COVID-19 from training land from the demo version of VHS2. And now we can continue by copying the, the other, the other, um, yeah, the other structures we, we, can, we can work with right now with this, which are firstly the outbreaks. This, is uh, highly configurable and this can be adapted to create outbreaks for every organization unit or which is the, the, the main case, one uh, outbreak just for the entire uh, hierarchical structure. So you can, you can see all this information in the, in the page, uh, in the main page of the project. Now we can copy the, the cases once this is done, I can quickly show you just uh, the result in the data. This is now a, a development oriented version. So we are not focusing right now pretty much on, on, on the efficiency of the transmission. And we are repeating some, some requests to the APIs just for, for doing this like alpha version of the scripts. And lastly, I can copy information about the contacts and relationships. Yeah, 
that's all. So if we, well, I have to log in again because I'm using the same user and password for this. And yeah, that would be all we have right now. As you can see here, we have now all of our cases copied and our contacts and relationships. Yeah, so that's all I'm, I'm going to pass now the, the presentation to Petar, which is going to, to wrap up this. Okay, Th uh, thank you, Pablo. Thank you very much for, for showing. So as Pablo said, so this is the functionality that, uh, that we have so far. So far, it's, uh, it's a set of scripts that uh, we can run and communicate the, between two APIs. The only issue we have is the, the, the organization needs, but this is more uh, issue on the API uh, definitions themselves. So I will just uh, like to end with, uh, with uh, just sharing with you information on how to contact us and uh, web pages where you can where you can see more information about the the project itself. So here you have the the web page of the of the project. You have contact, contact information at the, at the side of GoData and WHO with contact person Sarah, Sarah Hollins. And then on the UPC side and the D team uh, research group, I'm, I, will, I will be the contact person. And also, you can visit our GitHub page where we are putting commenting the code that uh, is being developed. So um, that will be all from us. If uh, I will pass now the, the presentation and uh, you can we can continue and later discuss, I don't know if we discuss now or the questions or after the session is over. Let's, let's do the questions after the dam is uh, ready. So then we will. Okay, great. Okay. I, I, I see that someone already has a question. Yes. So Dan, if you can continue. Can you? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, greet you, I bring you greetings from uh, colleagues at uh, Ministry of Health in Uganda, as well as uh, the WHO team that worked with us under the National Identification Regulator Authority. Uh, we're sharing with you experiences um, we have had for integrating ICD-11 in DHIS-2. Uh, by world background, we are now estimated at uh, 44 million people with a total fertility rate of 5.4 and a crude death rate of 6.4 per thousand. So uh, currently we have an estimated 281,000 deaths um, in the community, uh, but in the EHMIS we are recording um, 34,000 and um, uh, the regulatory authority is only able, at least for the last financial year, they registered and issued death certificates for 5,700. And so you can see, we have a very big uh, need to up our game in terms of mortality data, uh, capture, as well as uh, utilization. Um, <clears throat> then um, by our background, we see that we've had a few opportunities uh, that um, we have that can be used to rapidly uh, roll out ICD-11. First of all, in the constitution, um, is a right for all debts to be registered. And so the, the government uh, enacted an act of parliament that uh, created the National Identification Regulatory Authority to be responsible for all CRBS uh, activities. Um, we have had a history uh, of introduction of startup mortality list, but um, this didn't move far. We also have had a history of fab autopsy and ICD-10 in a, in a number of projects, as well as uh, we have had a number of our staff uh, trained in ICD-11, and there's some variable experience across the community in fab autopsies, mainly through partners that are DHSs and also those ones that are doing a number of studies. The area that is, is rather advanced is the area of maternal and perinatal death reviews, where 
we have almost all health facilities able to assist with this work. Also still needs support. Um, in looking at our status, we identified a number of challenges uh, that um, impeded um, uh, rollout of ICD-9 and 10 previously. And these were mainly around the fact that uh, those ones were involved with their small research projects that usually did not uh, proceed beyond their end time. And then also uh, the engagement at Ministry of Health at the time was limited and not aligned. And so coding of deaths was not aligned to its main priorities. We also didn't have enough local expertise for uh, scale up. And of course, as you know, previously ICD-10, uh, we had these large books that often were costly and from a practical point of view, were not very easy to use. Um, we did a reflection, uh, bringing on board a number of partners, um, both at the Ministry of Health, the Ident National ID, National Regulatory Authority for Identification, and then uh, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. We acknowledge that we have variable experience with ICD-10, but none with 11. And uh, a number of training institutions actually were still using ICD-9, particularly in the pathology departments when they are doing post-mortems. And then uh, the CRVS task force was present, but it needed to be strengthened. We also noted that the National Identification Regulatory Authority had different tools from those ones we are using at Ministry of Health to uh, capture deaths, both for notification and also the certification of cause of death. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had a number of people who had been trained, and so we used this as an opportunity to identify our master trainers. And then uh, in the beginning, we had planned to start with the startup mortality list, but this app could not be run on the version of DHIS2 that we had. So we moved on to upgrade our DHIS2. And then the, <coughs> the, code, the startup mortality app was um, integrated. A medical certificate of cause of death, which was based on the WHO International Certificate of Cause of Death. It was in but it was only went ahead and did um, standardization of tools uh, between NIRA and ourselves. And now this took us to the point of uh, integration of ICD. Uh, 11 into the DHIS2 and our electronic medical records. And this happened at a time when uh, the WHO had announced at the World Health Assembly uh, for international rollout of ICD-11. So in terms of process, uh, we conducted uh, a, a requirements analysis um, for integration of ICD-11 API into the DHIS2 instance. And uh, this informed um, the plan for uh, software integration and the coding tool. Then we went on to integrate the module uh, in, uh, and this included uh, the embedded coding tool into the national DHIS2 instance. And of course now this provides uh, a smart search functionality accessible within uh, the application. Uh, we went ahead to conduct a testing, both off-site for the prototype and later on uh, with the feedback that we got from the medical experts, uh, we now conducted on-site uh, piloting of the software um, and at seven uh, health facilities. This now has been fine-tuned into the DHIS2 and we are now at a process at the step of uh, moving uh, it from the uh, testing uh, environment to the production environment. Uh, when you access the uh, DHIS2 and you go to the applications uh, interface and you click there, you're able to see all the applications and we have put uh, it there as with an ICD-11 icon. And so this is where you would access the form. 
And when you do access the form, um, you will create the case as is normally the process. And what is unique about the data that you see uh, is that we now have put a field for national identification number. And once we have completed the integration of the APIs between DHIS2 and the, the national identification register, you would, for example, just insert uh, the national identification number of the deceased and it will populate all the details that you need uh, on this page, uh, except of course for uh, whether they were teachers and so forth, if they have changed position, that may be different. Um, also, we are able to, um, when you put the, the gender of, of the person, it will produce um, uh, a, a, a dialogue box that will ask you to make sure that you complete um, the in the in, in the second part of the of the of the form uh, whether it was a maternal death or not, but also if you insert the date of birth and the age uh, of the disease comes to under one year, it will ask you to fill uh, the part that is for uh, infant deaths. Um, so. The, the good thing now with ICD-11 is that uh, the embedded coding tool uh, is provide a smart search function. And, and, and once you insert a search term, it will give you a number of dropdowns rather uh, from which you can select uh, the code and the cause of death uh, as uh, contrary to uh, just having a simple dropdown list. And uh, you can see on the bottom uh, right that this is just a pre-filled um, case that uh, would appear like this. And you can see that the difference here, we have included uh, a, a field for cause of death free text in case we do not have uh, the, the phrase uh, in, in the existing, the search term in the existing uh, ICD-11 uh, database. And so that means that we have arranged to have these new terms captured in the background so that we can continue to update our local search terms. Then of course, at the extreme right, you have the time uh, based on how the cascade of events happened. So we'd like now to show you just a brief um, example of how this works. So this is a 39 year old, uh, a uh, woman who procured, uh, uh, who had an induced uh, abortion and died from uh, uh, septic shock uh, and had a perforated uterus. So uh, I'll go now to brief demo and then we'll see how this uh, works. So here we have prefilled uh, before this um, uh, session. Uh, we'll have the case number there, and then we'll have the national identification number. And what I wanted to show you about uh, if, for example, this one was female, and once you put female, then it will give you uh, that dialog box up to show you that please remember to fill the section for women uh, who deceased while pregnant or within six weeks of delivery. So that is something that we added that we thought is very good. So for this particular case, she had uh, uh, septic shock. And so this would give you um, uh, a drop down. And then, uh, of course, for those of you familiar with the coding, you, you can see uh, the button here with a plus that we are, will require for mandatory post coordination, but uh, we won't go into that for now. And so uh, this lady, um, so the amount of time um, was in days. She had spent uh, 11 days with sepsis. And then um, previously she had had uh, induced abortion and a perforated uterus. So we put perforated um, uterus.
sorry. In a bit. Um, yes, so we have uh, injury of the uterus. Um, and she had had, uh, it was uh, 16 days before uh, she died. And then um, she had induced abortion that led to um, that led to the infection and so forth. So, um, so okay. So now we included um, a field, which you don't find on the usual international form, uh, state the underlying cause of death. And um, you can see it brings you one of the rules uh, that note that any values whose code begins with any injuries as such cannot be used as a cause of death. But um, <clears throat> uh, for the cause of death for this particular case, uh, is, as you can see with this code, so briefly, this is just to take you through uh, how the coding um, tool has been embedded within uh, the form. And uh, this is the kind of experience uh, that we have. Um, so I will now take you back to the rest of the presentation. Yeah, so, um, so basically we have some early lessons. Um, we have uh, for the facilities that the regional referral hospitals where we have done the piloting, we have noted that uh, there is a reduction in need for paper forms because if a clinician has uh, uh, been taking care of a client and, and she, pass, he or she passes on, they can straight away summarize the case and then go into the system and, uh, and do this coding. Uh, we also have seen that we have done a number of uh, training of trainers uh, and we have been able to reduce uh, the training to three days. And of course, this comes with reductions uh, in, in cost. Uh, the training is simplified, especially because of the standardization within the ICD-11 as well as uh, the embedded uh, smart uh, search that enables us to have a high level of accuracy. We actually, in, in the testing of the training participants, we saw a high level of coding accuracy among other trainees, especially where we had also included our local uh, <coughs> diagnostic terms. And then, of course, now standardization of underlying cause of death is a lot easier. And we think that we'll see less uh, errors in coding going forward. Uh, what you see on the right side of the slide is just an example from one of the regional referrals that have started to use this. Uh, basically, you can be able to access data as and when you need it. Um, this is just one of those examples. In terms of our next steps, our major focus now is one to complete uh, the integration between the DHIS2 and the National Identification Register so that we can have easy access to data on the, 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 the details around the death from the national ID system, but also for the National Identification Register to be able to access the underlying cause of death so that they can uh, be able to issue uh, the certificates as is mandated uh, by law. And then, of course, the next step now is to, we are working on cas preparing for, to do the casket trainings, uh, supported by both the colleagues in Division of Health Information at Ministry of Health, NIRA, and uh, uh, support from World Health Organization. 
So thank you very much. Uh, briefly, that is what I hope to share with you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, so yeah, so I, I think we, we have about five minutes left of the of official time. And, and, and as I said, after that, we will continue with the expert launch uh, using this same Zoom. Uh, the recording will stop and, and, uh, and maybe the group will be a bit smaller. Uh, so I think if, if anyone has any questions relating to the, to the topics we had so far, please comment them now. Uh, we will also go through the, the COP and see if there's any more questions there. Um, then maybe after, after the official end, we can also continue with general questions if you have when it comes to inter interability. So, um, so Sarah and, and, and the team, uh, I see there's a couple of, um, so I, I see already I replied there, Sarah, but I don't know if you want to also do it on, on the call. Um, just a little bit more details about the goal data. Sorry, can you say that question again? I think you just, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the, 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 the interviewability Q&A and I think you just replied to steal you, but I, I know. I yes, know. yes. No, I'm happy to reiterate if it's helpful. <laughs> Sure, sure, no problem. Um, so yeah, so the, the GoData tool was built actually several years ago in response to, to countries saying that they needed an, an easily deployable and free to use outbreak investigation tool that was really focused on contact tracing. Um, but it has evolved quite a bit be, after its extensive use in North Kivu and the, the last Ebola outbreak. And then um, now the demand during COVID-19. Um, and so we, we are, are very focused on creating an, an environment and infrastructure where um, we can we can provide a, as much documentation about our API for any tool to interact with any organization, any platform. Um, but because we got a repeated request about DHIS2 in particular, we we were working with uh, UPC on on this project, um, given that they they had expertise in working with uh, DHIS2 in the past and had approached us with this idea. Um, but but no, we, it's, it's not necessarily specific to DHIS2. We, we want to provide generic sort of interoperability support and vision. And then um, uh, any tool that, that needs to communicate with the platform, we hope to be able to um, provide the resources that are, that are needed to make that happen. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Um, maybe, maybe, Dan, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about how are you making the request from your, your DHS2 app and then into the ICD-11 service. Are you, do you know that? Do you, are you using a proxy or using course requests or how are you actually interacting and doing the searches on the ICD-11 service? That could be interesting to know. I think we have Simon on the call. Simon, Pnuka, would you be able to respond because he was involved in the development? Right. Simon? Ah, my mic can't be muted. We can hear you, Simon. Yes, hello? Yes, hello. you had the question. Oh, yes, okay, thank you. Um, so right now, um, the, way, the way the application runs is that um, the API is installed on the server that hosts, um, okay, it's, it's going to be host, I mean, yeah, it, the API is hosted on the same server that is running um, the demo. And so the requests are done um, from within the same um, environment. So there's no um, actual cross-domain referencing. And um, that also helps in, in, in accelerating the response, responses between um, the call and the actual um, response itself. Okay, thanks. Thanks, that clarifies it. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Martin, I see there's another question from the community of practice about uh, I-10 interoperability, whether that's available. So I, I assume that's I, I the 10 Yeah, so um, the only integration I know that when it comes to um, ICD-10 and DHS-2 is that we have an option set. I, I know uh, Nick is on the line, but I know so there is, exists some semi-official ICD-10-11 option set. I do not think the ICD-11 service supports 
ICD-10, but feel free to correct me if, if I'm wrong. I think that's ICD-11 only. I don't know if anyone knows um, the details of that. Maybe Simon, if, if you've worked with the, the ICD-11 service, do you know if that's also supporting ICD-10 or is it purely ICD-11? Um, well, to the best of my knowledge, it's ICD-11. Yeah. So, so, so there is, and I, I know there is an ICD-10 option set floating around. I think it's also on our play demo servers. So that, that would be um, uh, playdcs2.org slash demo. Um, if you go to options yesterday, there should be an ICD-10 uh, option set that you can actually download and, and use. Uh, I do not know if that's being updated uh, and or who really manages that, um, but that's the closest as I know. Um, I don't, I don't uh, know if anyone has any more details before that. I, I think Robert has uh, has details, but he's been chatting in the group chat. <laughs> okay, okay. Doesn't seem to be able to unmute himself. Max, I don't know. Can you can you? Hello. Uh, yes. You sure, I didn't take care of that now. Robert, you're. Oh, yeah, but thank you. So, so the API can also do ICD ten coding, but of course you don't have the the wealth and the the the, the capacity of the coding engine that is behind the API of the uh, on the ICD eleven side. And, and the other thing is that, that one please should bear in mind that, uh, of course, we, we are helping countries to migrate to ICD-11. So um, uh, it, it would be better not, not to use this, but in principle, it's possible. I don't know if Chan is online. He's the IT expert who can give even more detail to this. Uh, otherwise, we will need to do this offline. No, he's not there. Nenad, is Chan there? Uh, Chan will join at four o'clock. So there maybe we can defer this exactly to his presence. But the main point there is also that, that uh, it, it will be important to help countries to move to ICD-11 because the, the search, search functionality, also you can access the 10 through the API is, is much more powerful. I'll stop here back to you. Thanks, mm -hmm. thanks so much.